Good evening, and welcome to Maryland Democratic Party's headquarters, and welcome to the third event in our Maryland Climate Matters series. I'm Yvette Lewis. I am the chair of the Maryland Democratic Party. Tonight's event is in partnership with Maryland Democratic Party's Environmental and Climate Crisis Committee. First, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us this evening. Tonight also could not have happened without the support and the vision of Ed Hatcher and Angie Cannon. Thank you so much. I look forward to our continued work on this environmental series. And finally, thank you to everyone joining us in person tonight and online. Your dedication to fighting the climate crisis will ensure a better future for our children, our state, and our planet. Keisha Allen will be our moderator for tonight's panel discussion and will introduce the panelists. Keisha Allen is a Baltimore City resident and serves as a member of Maryland Democratic Party's Environmental and Climate Crisis Committee, as well as the Baltimore City Central Committee in the 46th Legislative District. She currently serves as president of the Westport Neighborhood Association and chairperson of the Westport Community Economic Development Corporation. Keisha and her fellow community leaders have worked tirelessly to promote affordable housing and revitalization efforts in her South Baltimore neighborhood while preserving its legacy, launching a community land trust and continuing to fight to eliminate air and land pollution that has plagued her neighborhood for decades. Thank you so much, Keisha, for moderating tonight. We hope you all enjoy our panel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time tonight to participate in our roundtable discussion. I'm Keisha Allen, and I'm serving as moderator for tonight's conversation. Climate change and environmental justice, the future of equality is tonight's topic. A discussion about how the fight against climate change and the fight for a more fair state are intertwined. Each month since May of this year, we have been having courageous conversations with community leaders, elected officials, community advocates, as well as everyday citizens about climate crisis with the purpose of educating Marylanders about how climate change will impact them. Regardless of where in the state we live, the goal is to get everyday people engaged with the most pressing issue. Tonight, we have on our panel, State Delegate Stephanie Smith, Maryland House of Delegates, District 45. Thank you, Keisha, for the warm introduction. I just want to first thank the Maryland Democratic Party for hosting this very important set of conversations. Um, I represent the 45th District, which is East Baltimore, Northeast Baltimore City. It's also the hottest part of Baltimore City. It is the part of the city that has the least amount of tree canopy. So when you consider the threat that climate change poses to our globe, the threat is not being experienced uniformly. There are some communities that are more vulnerable, that are more at risk to the threats that extreme weather pose, they're more, um, they're more vulnerable to the threats extreme heat poses, and then also there is an intended um, economic impact to climate change that they are least um, position to withstand. So I feel that um, climate change isn't a future threat, it's a present threat, a present threat, an ever present threat. And I'm really happy to be part of this conversation about how Maryland can take leadership. As the census just noted, we're the fourth most diverse state in the country and the most diverse state on the East Coast. But the presence of different people does not necessarily secure that they'll be treated fairly under the policies we put in place. So we have to not only celebrate our diversity, but center those that are most vulnerable to the threat of climate change as we address the problem. So I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you. Next in our panel, Delegate Regina Boyce, Maryland House of Delegates, District 43. Thank you so much, Keisha, and thank you so much for the Maryland Democratic Party for um, having me and having us here to talk about this uh, very important uh, topic. And most importantly, I come from, uh, represent a district, uh, the 43rd District, uh, which is very diverse. It's diverse in housing. It's diverse in tree canopy. It's a diverse in non-tree canopy. But what's interesting about it is in certain places where there is tree canopy, there is an issue of inland 
flooding. Every year, uh, there is a certain area of my district that floods so much so that for the last 50 years in that district, in that particular area, it has been a problem. And so um, when we talk about climate change, you heard the delegate uh, talk about um, heat islands. We also have issues of inland flooding where every time there is a torrential downpour, poor, there are neighbors um, praying that it's not going to be the one that floods their property again for the infinite uh, you know, time. And so it becomes uh, detrimental um, for them and trying to find a solution, not only because of climate change and the way our rain falls, but also because of our infrastructures that can't manage all of the water that is coming in. And so we have a, a huge issue in uh, Baltimore City when it comes to inland flooding. And um, that is just one example of many issues that we're fighting within not only our district, but across the state, uh, inland flooding. So remember that. So I'm really honored to be here. I'm glad to have this conversation about the many different um, aspects and, and very differently, um, each part of the state is affected differently. And I wanted to just point out that we're really talking about climate equity um, and not necessarily climate equality because every space has a different issue that it is fighting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Delegate Boyce. Next, Abel Olivo, Executive Director, Defensores de la Cuenca. Correct me if I pronounced that wrong. No, you did perfect. Thank you, Keisha. Uh, hello, everybody, and good evening. My name is Abel Olivo. I'm the Executive Director for Defensores de la Cuenca. We work to engage Latinos and Spanish speakers in watershed-related issues. Uh, we do that by creating opportunities for people to have experiences in nature, uh, fun, positive experiences that really um, speak to the priorities of the Latino community. Uh, that's family, faith, uh, and, and uh, you know, nature. A lot of our participants uh, view nature and the environment through the lens of faith, uh, creation care, working to uh, uh, be stewards of, of God's creation. So when we create these opportunities for people to have fun uh, as a family and we combine uh, these aspects that are important to our community, we're really working to engage them for the long term. Because we know we're, we're competing against people's most uh, precious commodity, and that's their time, time away from family, time away from church, and time away from work. So if we're able to create these opportunities that combine all three of those priorities, we're really working to invite more people into the green space for the long term. And that's not just stealing their, 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 um, their, their labor by planting trees or picking up garbage. We're really working to create a base of knowledge to create a, an educated individual and families to to make uh, choices uh, in their lives not only for their own uh, benefit but for the benefit of the community um, and um, our goal is to create leaders uh, to uh, of more Latinos and Latinas to invite more people into the space because we know that uh, lots of our community live in, in highly dense areas uh, with low tree canopy and high impervious surfaces, uh, with low air, poor air quality, poor water quality, and, and we need to have folks who live in these spots from these neighborhoods, from these areas, be as involved in the decision-making process as possible. And it's an honor to be here with Delegate Boyce, Delegate Smith, and Shoshanta Campbell here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Abel. Last but not least, Shoshanda Campbell, Youth and Community Engagement Coordinator, South Baltimore Community Land Trust. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for having me. Um, and thank you for discussing this really important issue today. Um, I think that at the South Baltimore Community Land Trust, we focus on community-led um, development without displacement and also challenging the system that we have right now, which is a a system that is reliant on burning and burying, using incineration and landfilling as the way to deal with our waste. Um, when we think about climate change, we have to think about the impacts that comes with the way we deal with our waste. Um, and that is, um, you know, right now, that is happening through this incinerator that sits in the South Baltimore communities um, in Baltimore. And that's how the waste is dealt with. And that is polluting the air. That is literally causing health impacts to residents. And so coming together to really think about a solution that does not sacrifice the lives of some to deal with the burden of waste that we all produce. 
Um, and so I'm really glad that we are having this conversation to talk about this because it has to be a change. And I know together we can create that change to solve this problem and create a zero waste system um, that's respectable to our lives, our health, and our planet. Um, and so I thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you, Shoshanda. So we're just gonna jump right into the questions, the discussion topics. And I'm just gonna start with the first one. For those, of, for those who don't know, what does the term environmental justice mean? I'll let any of you answer that question. Who wants to take that? Um, uh, yes, and so depending on who you talk to, there's many different definitions, but I would, I would say that environmental justice means, it, I think it asks a question and it also defines where is it safe um, and where is it um, appropriate for us to live and work and play and learn and build and, and what are the barriers to that, if not, and that's where I think in some of our environmental justices. Uh, come in, um, you know, if it's not safe to live, if it's not safe to build, if it's not a place to learn, if it's not safe um, to to build there, then it is it, it ends up becoming somewhat of an environmental justice issue. And so um, it asks the question and it makes a definition. And so we have to look at where we look. Is it safe? Is the air clean? Is the water clean? Um, where are the trees? Um, how is the infrastructure? We have it really asks us a question about our livability um, as it relates to our land, our wind, our water, land. And I think just to add to that, exactly that, but also it also intersects with social justice, which we have seen a lot of that when it comes to environmental injustice, it is in communities of color and low income. And those are the communities that's deeply impacted um, with the pollution to air, water, land. And they consistently have to live with that and be blamed for the reason that it is that way. When there is a structural, um, there were structures put in place that place these things in communities that's of color, like 80% of incinerators are placed in communities of low income and of color. That's not an accident. That's not, and it's time to call it out for not being an accident, and it's time to actually change that. People shouldn't have to fight for this environmental injustice that's going on. They just shouldn't happen. Shashanda, I, I just want to thank you for what you're saying because it's super important. Um, a lot of times when people talk about environmental um, justice, they tend to talk about what is not just when they're really describing environmental injustice. So I want to make sure that when we're saying a just environment is one where your skin color, your ethnicity, your religion, your um, income does not determine how healthy your air, water, soil is, that that's not um, a basically something that's going to bring harm to you. And to Shoshanda's point, um, the leading cause or the leading indicator of why someone lives near a hazardous waste site is race, and I think we have to be explicit. Oftentimes we want to talk about class separate from race, but even an upper income community of color is more vulnerable to being um, situated next to a hazardous or polluting entity, more so than even a lower income white community. So we have to be very clear when we're looking at policies that when we're talking about environmental justice, you have to be comfortable discussing mm -hmm. environmental racism because you can't really have a real conversation about environmental justice if you're not having a conversation about environmental racism. Thank you. Delegate Smith, what are examples of environmental injustices that Marylanders are suffering from throughout the state? In fact, who are those who are suffering? I th I'm thinking in, I believe, Prince George's County, you have coal ash sites that have been, you know, wreaking havoc for communities for many years. You have, um, as um, the good delegate voice mentioned, there are certain communities that are low-lying, right? And this is in every community. There are certain communities like, well, why is that community um, situated in an area that's going to be home to repeated um, flooding and other um, things that are going to lose property value? It's generally um, those with less um, social and political capital that are, that are unfortunately had been co-signed to certain areas of a city or a municipality or a county to live. All those things are intentional. They're not accidental, they're designed. Um, I know for um, folks that are living near polluting entities like the incinerator, um, the fact that you're being subject to pollution but in many instances, if you look at who works at the incinerator, I doubt that many of the people who work there live in the communities where they're situated. And this is customary across the country. Polluting entities don't tend to employ the communities that are directly around them. So 
environmental injustices like this across Maryland are deeply intertwined with economic stagnation and economic injustice as well. You mentioned Prince George's County. Are there any other areas of the state? Often I think we leave the Eastern Shore out of the conversation, Western Maryland. We tend to talk about, you know, Central Maryland or any other well, areas. Well, it's interesting, right? <laughs> so in Western Maryland, formerly home to um, um, a paper um, mill, the Luke plant, that was the actually number one dioxin emitter in the state at one point. Um, I think that, um, for example, facilities like this that are no longer with us, um, Many people just want a job that can take care of their family, and sometimes they may not be overly concerned with some of the, um, the environmental harm that comes with it. But um, there is a cost burden to every Marylander when we have to help people that do not have the ability to um, pay for their medical care. There, you, you, there is a monetized burden to pollution, and we all pay it as taxpayers when we're helping those who have chronic breathing ailments that unfortunately live in the shadow of facilities like that there is a burden to every taxpayer whether they live next to the facility or not. So absolutely, um, there have been industries that have been harmful to um, the air, like um, that mill I mentioned in Western Maryland, but there's also been um, agricultural activities on the Eastern Shore that have been profoundly um, damaging in some respects to waterways and soil. So we have to um, realize this is a threat that covers every part of our state, not just the most populated parts. Thank you. Uh, Shashanda. How can we fight climate change while also addressing environmental issues throughout Maryland? I think that it's looking at exactly, um, looking at these sources of pollution that's coming, like this incinerator that's in the South Baltimore community. Um, it really means that when you look at that incinerator, there is, a, there is a price that residents are paying. And Ch Chesapeake Bay found that that price is $55 million a year in health damages to the residents that live close that's $55 million a year to health damages. Someone has to pay that, and it is not the people that are polluting the air that's paying it, it's the residents, and that's not okay. Um, and so it's really looking at those systems and then looking at how we are supporting them. And so that is, they get subsidies that are technically, that is residents paying to be polluting themselves. They're paying to harm themselves. That's not okay, it's time, that is, incineration is looked at as renewable energy. It is not renewable energy, it is dirty. It is dirty and it is costing residents their lives. It is time to take things like those credits from there and it's time to build new infrastructure so we can deal with our waste in a way that does not sacrifice communities or, or lives or our planet. Um, and when you look at landfills, landfilling is, when you look at that, it's a lot of food waste that's going there that's creating methane. We can stop that. Compost, create these facilities that's needed, a compost facility where those waste can go. It does not have to be burned and it does not have to be buried. And so it's time to create new systems, creating new modules to deal with the waste that we have that's not just easy burn it or bury it. And I think that we are, ha I see that conversation happening in communities and that conversation has to travel up to policies actually put in place to protect communities against these polluting industries that comes in communities uh, without their permission. Thank you. Abel, what do you see as the biggest threat to environmental justice and equity? Oh, there's so many things <laughs> to where to start. I, I think that, that one of the one of the big traps that a lot of organizations get into in terms of engaging communities of color is bringing resources to bear for communities of color without actually investing in those same communities. When they go to, to, um, to invest in communities of color, they are actually investing in themselves. Mm -hmm. They're investing in their own infrastructures. They're investing in their own projects and their own programs. Maybe they're bringing in a black African-American person to be on staff. Maybe they're bringing in a Latino Latina who can speak Spanish. That's investing in themselves, and then they're not actually investing in the communities. That is bringing money to folks who are on the ground, bringing money and opportunities to train folks to be more involved, more aware in the decision-making pro process, um, and really helping to establish uh, the infrastructure needed for um, organizations that are led by 
black African American and Latino folks because that's what's missing. It's mainly white led organizations that have established these programs that are going into communities of color that aren't really prepared culturally to connect with, to uh, bring about programs in a meaningful way. Uh, so it's the lack of, of investment in, in the, the people, uh, I think, that is really um, going to be a huge hindrance um, to moving forward and making, making progress. Does anyone have anything to add to Abel's comment or a different opinion, perspective? True. I mean, what he's talking about is convenience and invention. Right. It's convenient to have some of these because we 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 benefit to a degree for some of these um, uh, uh, inventions or conveniences. And, you know, we talk about plastic invented 50 odd years ago, a convenience, but it is killing us. So when we talk about um, the incinerator, I'm sure was built out of convenience to get rid of this trash versus burying it. But it is killing us. And so when we think about our most. Um, when we think about our biggest threat to the environment, and, and again, the word equality it, or more equity, is that our need for convenience is killing us. The need for convenience and invention, think about phones, um, iPhones or your Android, like every year, every six months, there's a new phone. What happens to the old one? becomes electronic junk, it becomes electronic trash, it becomes electronic waste in some other country that then has to clean it up as well, and typically a black and brown countries. And so again, we have to really talk about, uh, you know, I think to what Shoshana was getting to is again, what are, how are we lessening, right? Because it's, we can close down the incinerator tomorrow, we can stop burying, we can start composting, we can do all these things, but the reality is we still have all this stuff that we make and consume that is nothing but junk that we end up throwing away, burying, and burning anyway. And so how do we lessen um, the cheap products, the cheap plastics that are low quality, right? They're easy to make, they're low quality, but they break easy and they become trash. How do we lessen our trash and that we have to talk about that in a way we talk about what conveniences are we willing to give up um, in order to um, save our planet. And, and that's what it is. That is what it is, it's cheap stuff. If you, this cups, you know, somebody made it, it's a great cup, but I can also get it in five different versions from five different companies of five different um, price breaks depending on how quickly they can make it. This is glass. Something else is plastic. And so we have to really talk about um, our, our need for convenience and what conveniences are we willing to give up to lessen the junk that ends up becoming the invention, that ends up becoming the incineration, that ends up becoming what we burn. It's become stuff that's in our waters that we can't get rid of. We have to talk, talk about it. And I think it also boils down to the question of who's responsible for it. Who's responsible for this waste that it's produced? Is it the consumers, the end result that it, whose hands it in then last? Or is it the producers that's constantly producing this, this waste that then goes into communities? And then there isn't really many, there isn't a lot of options, especially when you're dealing with a certain amount of money. Plastic is, is, is affordable. It's affordable for communities. And so it's giving a new option for people to make the right decision in a, in a, in a range that they can actually afford. It is not, it's not only a convenience, but it's also a price difference. There is a price that's on these items that makes it convenient for communities to just get a hold of it. That has to be changed. We have to have a new system of redesigning products and give people an option at an affordable price so everyone can afford it. And then it's also looking at, again, who's responsible? It should not be the burden on communities of calling low income when most of this stuff is burnt to actually deal with the production of it. It's not that it shouldn't be the responsibility. It should be back on the people that is producing this to then take back the waste that they produce and cannot avoid it. It's time to, to, to tell it. It's not business as casual. It's, it just can't be because communities are suffering from your production. And you have to address that and you have to change it. If you want to keep being available to these people and making a product, you make a product whose end result is not disposed of by incineration or landfilling. That's what you do. And so that's who the responsibility is on. And there has to be some extended um, responsible for these producers of plastic, a bill created policy that's backing up this. So then they can't just keep putting it in communities to be disposed of in those two ways. That cannot be the solution. 
I want to jump in here to discuss, like, well, what do, what do we do, right? So this is an opportunity for policymakers. I mean, once upon a time, America was the leading producer of clean air technologies. We're not. China is now. A place not known for clean air is now known for producing most clean air technologies. So once upon a time, American innovation was helping us to solve problems, and that's why we were able in the 70s to get the Clean Air Act passed, to get the Clean Water Act passed. It took a lot of advocacy, but also it was paired with the fact that America had superior research um, capabilities to figure out how we could you know, make uh, you know, the emissions cleaner, a lot of different things that we could do. So I think it's incumbent upon us as policymakers to feel like figure out how can we incentivize the solutions that Shoshana is talking about. So when we are subsidizing um, renewables that are in fact dirt, dirty, that is not the best use of our um, policymaking um, powers to incentivize new behaviors. I know that many people, um, if they had a choice between a clean job or a dirty job and the price was the same, they probably pick the clean job. But right now, people are just doing what they can to survive. So I think that as a state and as um, a federal government, there's some, some real low-hanging fruit. I know the Biden administration um, actually changed some regulatory items to, to make it um, possible for people to repair things that previously were not um, repairable. Because back to Delegate Boyce's point, some things are becoming trash simply because people are unable to fix them. Once people can't find a necessary component to extend the life of something they purchase, they just throw it away. <laughs> but if they could somehow repair it, um, that would also mean less repeated buying, which might not work for some people's capitalistic sensibilities, but it does address some of the issues we're talking about, about junk creation. Um, there's also, I think, opportunities to incentivize with young people. I think our young people have solutions. We've been talking about a lot of different people, but the youth particularly, they have a lot at stake. They know they'll be living under the threat of climate change much longer. And I think we need to really start um, in our K through 12 and our collegiate system, creating more pipelines for creating these types of solutions. And I, I mean, that could be curriculum adjustments, but it could also be um, actually paying people to go to college with this express goal of creating a cadre of green professionals in Maryland that are ready and prepared to address some of these challenges. Um, I know that some of this is gonna be behavior behavioral change as well. Um, as Shashanda mentioned, if about a quarter of our um, waste is comprised of organics that could be composted, we have to think of the easiest ways to get people to compost. Don't make it where they have to trek across a community or on a bus to do it. We have to figure out how we can make it as easy as possible for people to live um, in a more sustainable manner, because I believe that people will do the right thing if it's not overly cumbersome, but as policymakers, we have to figure out how to deliver the opportunity. So that somewhat leads to my next question. Uh, Delegate Boyce, how can legislators work to reduce pollution in affected communities to the same level of non-affected communities? That is a great question and it actually builds off of what Shashanda and Delegate Smith are talking about. Um, this past session, I sponsored a bill, um, Maryland Paint um, stewardship program, and the program essentially takes post-consumer paint, which is about 10%, and recycles it at about 85%. So 10% of the paint that would usually go into the trash, the incinerator, or landfill is captured and reused. You know, the reality is all of us here have some a number of cans of paint in a basement, in a shed somewhere, but all that can be recycled. And so one of the ways that it's been doing is looking at extended producer responsibility legislation. And what that does is says you, you pay a small fee, not a tax, a fee on a product so that the producer, to Shoshanda's point, has to manage that waste, mattresses, uh, things like cell phones, things like, um, uh, um, other thing I'm thinking about, syringes, um, those type of things that are in some ways definitely necessary, but also tend to be the most amount of junk um, and waste and dumping um, in our, not only in our city, but across the state. And so what does that look like? And so what does that look like? It means you pay this fee for them to come back and capture all of this stuff and do something with it. Or if that's not the case, again, looking at how do you create something that, um, it's either it biodegrades in a way or does not cause more junk. Um, and to Delegate Smith's point, it's also an opportunity. Um, when I was in Morocco in 2015, I was with a family 
And with Madame, I went down to the souk. And at the top of the souk was this place where anything that was broken, you took there. There was no, there's no such thing about throwing something in the trash. Your cell phone, the iron, the toaster oven, it was all kind of appliances that they had there that somebody fixed. There's what you call a green economy, right? But it has to be made with quality first. So then it's secondly, it can be then fixed. But if it's not made to last, which means it's not quality built, it then becomes trash. And so we can do what we used to do is make things of quality that last longer. And while it's not a benefit, it does keep the toaster oven, for instance, from breaking in three years versus 15 or 20 years. That becomes then trash. But that those are the things, extended producer responsibility, but also looking at ways to incentivize and create new industry, which is not hard and certainly can be profitable with skilled labor. It takes a skill to know how to fix an electronic. It, you know, some people are tinkerers. Where are the tinkerers in our um, elementary, in our middle schools? There's tons of them and turn them into folks that say, I can fix that. But again, it has to be something that has at the forefront been made of quality. Um, also, uh, really we, we have to, and this is something that came up this past session is stop looking at things sometimes as just a big goal and looking at what we're actually going to do. Um, there's the goal, but then that goal still has to be implemented and somebody has to make, has to reach that goal. But the reality is what are we actually doing? And so in some cases, sure, we've changed our bus fleets so that they're electrified. That's great. Um, you know, what else can we actually do? And I want to give one example. When I was working for the city in 2010, um, the, uh, what they call the Kirk Avenue moderniz a bus modernization depot. And what was happening is in that community, um, there were hundreds of people who were dying from cancer for the last 20 years. And they, the community related it to, um, uh, the bus depot there that has buses that sit idly right in the community for decades. And so the community came together. We put, they put pressure along um, on MTA to do something about it. Well, what ended up happening was every time the MTA got a new fleet of, of uh, hybrid or electrified buses, that was the first place that got buses. There was a uh, vacant building actually across the street from the actual depot. They purchased that building and now all their operations happen on the inside. And with the, the electrified buses and the hybrid buses, what ends up happening now is you don't have something idling and you have something inside. So there's no need for the, um, the fumes that would be coming from these buses. And so they changed, again, making the point, you can make the change. The change can be made with a bit of pressure and some ingenuity and some thought, but they were able to take what was there, um, stay in the community, still be able to provide jobs, but cut out the, the, the polluting part of um, the, the, the buses, uh, which was them being out there, being outside, idling um, and for, for decades. And so it's just an example about what can be done um, with a little forethought um, and, and with a little um, incentivization, but it, it can be done. We just have to start talking about what we can do, not necessarily the goal. Can I add to that, uh, yes, Delegate Boyce's point? Yes, please. Point, I you was know. going to actually ask if you uh, had anything to add to that, or I was going to change the question around yeah. about what, as citizens, how can we help or give ideas to legislators? Um, so as Delegate Boyce just pointed out, a legacy facility that we know is harming the community, we know the impacts. We need to be changing, you know, wouldn't it be great if we can talk about that now as we're developing out these, mm -hmm. these, these uh, facilities. In Prince George's County, Inner Beltway, where I live, um, the D DC government is looking to buy a plot of land and, and put a bus washing station there, right? We know what happens when you have buses idling. We know when, what happens when you have diesel uh, engines running, when you have stormwater runoff. It pollutes the, uh, the water, it pollutes the air, and, and this is a primarily black African-American community mm -hmm. that already has a, 
um, a, a, a mining, clay mining facility nearby that already has a trash transfer station nearby. And they're still talking about moving forward with this. It doesn't make any sense because we know the harmful impacts that they have. Um, so we need, to, we, we need to be talking about these land use policies yes. and, and how it impacts, you know, you want to talk about environmental racism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the impacts that these decisions of policymakers at the local level have. You know, the, the state level folks have limited uh, capability to, uh, to influence that, and we need to make sure that we're activating our citizens and making the connections between a clean environment and health. The, the health indicators, the, these co-determinants of health by tree canopy, impervious surfaces, really uh, dictate the, the, the health quality indicators that we have in our communities. And again, we know the impacts, we know that it's harmful, we know that it's higher rates of asthma, diabetes, heart disease, that, that, that and then if you extend that out, that, that goes into educational attainment, that goes into long-term economic um, earning potential. Uh, the, the impacts are, are far more than just nice trees in, in a nice place. It is long-term, lifelong uh, negative impacts potentially. Thank you. And again, it brings us back to who lives there. And, and you, you hinted to that, who lives there. Again, people of color, people may uh, have a limited understanding of how to navigate our legislative system. Exactly. Uh, and unfortunately, and not to you, a delegate uh, Boyce or delegate Smith, sometimes our legislators don't live, often they don't live in the most, in the neighborhoods with the most critical problems. Yeah, so they're going home to a different community, you know, oops, sorry, I couldn't do it for you this year. Or sometimes, unfortunately, they use the word gaslighting us that it's not as bad as it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and again, not even talking about my own legislators in case they're watching and I don't want them to think that I'm talking about them, but it's just something that we have to think about is the people who are impacted the most, we often punish them because they don't have the knowledge as others, as, as us and others to fight these things. Yeah, and I, and I think it's just that, and I think that we also have to talk about at a point in time there was a, there was trust that was broken in those communications. And I think that to gain that back, it has to be access to their legislation and to like just people that they can talk to, to learn more and like the access of information. How are you, how are you getting into those communities to give them access to that information, to let them know this is how you do this. When you have this problem, this is who you talk to. Um, and I think that it's definitely relearning that because a lot of people don't know that. And it's, you know, it just wasn't taught. And I think that that is very important to give people access to that. And then, you know, you might be surprised how they turn around. You might be surprised what they actually have to say about in communities because I'm on the ground with them every day. And, you know, they're, they're finding solutions in their community. They're just not, they're not getting it to the person they need to. And I think that's the communication breakdown that we're having right now. And I think that, you know, like, as you said, like, these are things that we know are harmful in these communities. And it's like, people are hurting. People are dealing with also trying to afford their, 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 their rent. They're trying to put food on their table for their kids. They're trying to figure out how they're going to get their kids through college in these communities. And so it is hard for them to then, you know, some of them don't even have access to internet. Mm -hmm. They don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the problem. They're in this dark spot and they need, to get to, they need to get out of that and they need help sometimes. And I think that it's okay to like go down into those communities and talk with people because they have ideas and they have solutions for problems that's in their community that they've been dealing with for years, years. They know that they, they're ready for that, that, that change and that shift. And talking with them, I know this, you know, they're ready for like those compost bins. They're ready to figure out, okay, how do, how do we get that closer to us? How do we get that in our communities? And, they, and you know, and so it's just giving those informations. And you know, I think as nonprofit organizations, we try to branch that, you know, we try to like bridge those problems, but it's hard because there is a lot of residents and it's so little of us. Um, and so I think that it definitely needs that communication barrier that has been broken down to be rebuilt um, and both sides to come together because literally we can only change these systems that have been in place for years if we work together. That's the only way it's going to change. And so it's acknowledging that there was wrong done, there is wrong still being done, but we can change it and let's come together and figure out how we do that to make it accessible for everyone. And I want to say to um, both Keisha and Shoshanda's points about how sometimes the decision maker or the policy maker may be unaware 
of the depths of the challenge if they don't live in a community that is proximate to the threat, right? And I think that, um, you know, there might be formal tours that we have as legislators to see sites for a variety of reasons, but I've been really encouraged that um, within this cohort, um, within the MGA, particularly in the House, um, just regular members are inviting people across the state to see either good or challenging things happening um, with the uh, environment in their community. And I think that's really an important part of the sharing because um, I might have a perspective representing Baltimore City, but it doesn't mean I don't care about what's happening in another part of Maryland. And I would like to, um, you know, to learn more about the challenges and opportunities on the environmental front. And I, and I just want to applaud the colleagues that have taken that initiative outside of being a chair of a committee or something that seems more formally empowering to do so. That that we realize we have an obligation and opportunity to um, do it amongst ourselves. But I think Abel made a critically important point. Um, I'm someone that used to work at a National Green nonprofit, and I do understand some of the challenges that he's mentioning, is that um, I think too often, not just green organizations, but sometimes the legislators within, um, you know, um, the, the spheres of influence, there's a way to be envir an environmentalist that can be very stifling, mm -hmm. very performative, and sometimes mm -hmm. narrow. And I think that we do our fellow Marylanders a disservice by um, insinuating we're going to bring sustainability to them or bring certain concepts to them. Because um, you know many um, people have grandparents who reuse everything, maybe to most people's annoyance. How many of us have opened what we thought were gonna be butter cookies, this but they is. weren't butter cookies? <laughs> were they they were sewing materials or buttons so i mean um it's not um what is it it's not butter in that bucket it's, right. not, it's not country crock right it's something else spaghetti sauce mm -hmm. so there's a lot of people that have been applying principles of reusing you know and everything to their life but they may have never considered themselves as an environmentalist but they were doing many of the things that we would say are responsible um, stewards of the environment in their community so I think we have to broaden the conversation particularly that's why we're even having this environmental justice um, focused discussion to um, make sure we're not presuming certain um, populations don't care about the environment just because they care about it or experience it differently. I know um, one of the things that I'm excited that the speaker has launched is a parks um, task force, which my colleague is on, about the great state parks that we have in Maryland. Um, but sometimes how people want to spend time in the park might be different than someone else. Someone else may want to play soccer. Another person may want to um, camp or, for me, pretend to be homeless. But it's just not my thing, you know? I'm not against anyone that wants to camp. But um, it's like there's more than one way that we can experience the environment. They're all valid, they're all appropriate. And even if it just means sitting on my stoop on an evening, I'm still outside in the environment. I didn't have to necessarily be surrounded by greenery to be outside and enjoying the earth. So I just wanna um, say I, I'm glad we're having this conversation because we need to give space mm -hmm. for people to articulate how um, the environment is important in their life. And we have to have that cultural competency to Abel's point to make sure people feel included in those conversations. And, and just to add on that <laughs> real quick, <laughs> so many great points being made here. You know, Shoshana said uh, access to the process is super important. When we have, you know, county uh, hearings, uh, lobby days on the Hill, we're asking people to take yep. 10 a.m. on a Tuesday afternoon yep. or Tuesday morning to come leave work. Mm -hmm. These are the communities that, that can least afford to not go to work. $50, $75, $100 a day, that means rent, that means mortgage, that means food, that means childcare. That is gonna take precedent over a policy issue any day because that is right now, right? So we need to, we need to give more thought to access of the process mm -hmm. yep. in, in that structure to allow the people that, that we say we want to hear from mm -hmm. to be able to come and share those thoughts uh, and their opinions too. And then to we it. expect them to stay three and four hours and yes, pay yes. 15 to $20 for prime for parking yep. during a business day yep. that they don't have necessarily. I, fortunately, I was able when I had to fight that stuff, I could afford it. But a lot of people can't afford it. But I shouldn't have been able to. I should not have had to pay. No one's validating it. You, you know, it's it's. And then me, I could do that. I had the time off. But others who don't have benefits like I do. They just say, you know what, I give up. I, I can't be without a job in the name of this important issue we're calling environmental justice and equality. You just, you know, it right. unfortunately becomes a first world problem, and then we're right back at where we started with 
mm-hmm. inequities. But I think this pandemic yeah. should be pushing a change. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I was excited about mm-hmm. this past session while we were all alone. <laughs> um, <laughs> in our offices and in the hallways, it did provide greater access. There were more people watching the sessions. There were more people testifying in committees. And so it to that point, that access has started to, to, like we're bringing it to the people instead of the people having to come to us. And I wanted to just drive home a couple of things um, the three of you said together, you know, going back to trust, trust has to be that we have to create the process at the beginning of process to say that that, that washing, bus washing station can't go there because it doesn't meet these 20 qualifications. Yep. And then it becomes, okay, who's surrounded, who's affected, how, when we're asking those questions at the beginning of the process, then we know at the end of the process that it's going to be or not. But if we're not asking them at the beginning, we continue to break the trust, we continue to have these issues, and we continue right back, continuing to have these conversations about how did this happen? How did this get here? And so we have to start, I think, going back to the beginning of discussion about what is environmental justice again, it, it has to ask those questions ahead of time. And we ask it through our zoning. We're asking it through our building processes. We're asking these things. And going back again to the point about not goals, but what are we doing? And that is the doing part is we have to ask the questions and we have to be just as innovative as we make junk, be innovative about how we are asking these questions on the forefront, coming up with the ideas and the innovation on the beginning so that at the end, we know if we can or if we can't have this. And if it's not going to be environmentally sustainable for all of us, then it, is, it can't exist. So I have just one last question to add. Uh, this may be best asked, um, answered by Delegate Boyce or Delegate Smith. Uh, do you think Hogan's policies have affected issues related to environmental justice? Absolutely. I mean, okay. well, I will start by saying that uh, the, I'm on the Environment and Transportation Committee, and one of the things when we first started in our session, freshman uh, sessions was that only 7% of the population uses transportation. Of in this in the state well when you don't make the investments to begin with you're never going to grow the amount of people that are going to use transportation so then it comes stagnant so then you can build your your plan to then have a widening of a highway that's going to have more cars on the highway and more congestion rather than split that money and put it into transportation um, and that's just one example of the disparity, uh, then it, the inequity of I'm not going to invest in thing this thing that would benefit everybody because not enough people are using it. Well, not everybody also has a car. Not everybody's traveling by highway. People are just trying to get around. Um, for instance, our city. I couldn't get to a baseball game the other day for a bus that was right out front of my house because the bus never came. And by the time I paid my fare on my app and realized the bus wasn't coming, I ordered an Uber. The Uber came right as the bus came. I can't cancel the Uber because then that's money. So I just spent $20 to get what downtown, which should have taken me $4 and, and, and 20 minutes, right? And so when you don't make the investment, then I'm the kind of person, well, not me personally, but you have people who then who says, I'm not going to invest in something that doesn't get me to where I'm going. I'm paying for a service that doesn't get to me to the place I need to go in a timely manner. Why would I then invest in it? So then you have a almost purposeful disinvestment because the system doesn't work. And so you don't have a, a system that's growing because the system doesn't work, which then justifies you polluting <laughs> more of our state by adding more surface so then we then can have cars so then we have more emissions and so that's just an example of the the inequities i think that happen when we talk about for instance environmental justice and we talk about things like transportation and environmental justice can i jump into it sure as we wrap up yes. yeah because mm -hmm. this is really important to me um we have had particularly on transportation which is oftentimes related to the environment because the less people we have driving, the better for our air quality. We have had a governor with a mid-20th century vision of transportation because he's so wedded 
to um, road development and highways in ways that really are not forward looking. Yeah. And it really is for, for me, obviously there's an environmental downside to over-reliance on, on cars to get around, but there's also an economic competitiveness issue. Um, when, we, when we're thinking about businesses that you wanna attract to a state, when you have a major region within a state that has such an anemic transit infrastructure, that actually hobbles our ability to attract the type of economic activity we want and the type of taxpayer who does not want to be in their car an hour and a half each day to get to work. So I think for those who are not necessarily aroused by the issues we've laid out around protecting the environment, cleaning our air, and things of that nature, I want you to know that we are spending money that is not going to yield a stronger economic outlook for Maryland. In addition to making us sicker, we're less competitive. competitive and I think that needs to be linked together more succinctly all the time. Thank you. So this concludes. Thank you, panelists, each of you, uh, for participating. This is a great conversation. And we'll be moving next to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, how can we ensure that federal and state funding for infrastructure, including for energy and climate resilience, is allocated to support equity and sustainability? I was going to say a new governor, but... Um, uh, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, that, that is going to happen. That's, that's the will good happen. news. That's the good, that's news. The good yeah. news. Or our potential Democratic governor, you know, would, you know, you can always think futuristic and, you know. Yeah, I think it's just also making those ties, as the delegate talked about, to economics, right? You, you, you know, when we talk about um, whether it's adaptation, um, whether it is, again, um, uh, transference of skills from one facility or job that's closing to another, not just transferring a job, but transferring those skills. And what does that look like? And how are we using monies like this to potentially invest in that adaptive reuse um, and changing. And so um, I think it's going to all be, uh, again, hopefully um, coming into play as we can in the background make these plans, knowing that we can then um, make them more robust, but mostly implementable under a new administration. Okay. I wanted to just give like some practical things. I definitely think that um, in a hopeful democratic governorship coming down the line, um, those who care about issues of climate adaptation and resilience should have a champion is my hope and whoever um, reaches um, the governor's mansion. And so we do have some good work happening at the municipal and the county level and city level where there are sustainability officers and folks that are focused on climate um, adaptation and resilience work. There needs to be convening of those minds because some of them are already meeting amongst themselves in the absence of that leadership at the top, but it would be so much more impactful to have that leadership coming from the governor and linking together those um, folks that are tasked with um, you know implementing that type of work to really figure out what's the best way to invest our state dollars at on the ground level based on um, capacity where does capacity need to be enhanced where does you know linkages need to be made um, across regions because it's not something you're always tackling on a municipal level sometimes multiple counties have to get together to really um, tackle different challenges related to climate change so I'm optimistic that with the new governor they will be not just a champion of the environment, but a powerful convener of those that have um, responsibilities around it. Investing in new type of infrastructures to deal with our waste, um, because we have seen using the same ones, um, burning and burying, um, that doesn't work. And it's time to invest in this new infrastructure, compost, um, recycling, and actually making it where people can participate in a real way um, that they want to, because they do. And it's time to actually have that conversation and put that investment in. Um, to make those changes. And, and I think that part of that investment is investing in the people. people. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when you put in these re resilient uh, best management practices to deal with these increasing intense uh, weather phenomenon, you know, to um, to mitigate the cost overall, if you're not talking to the folks who live there about what that is, there's going to be little interest in maintaining that and understanding that it's it's, you know, and more access to green space, cleaner air, cleaner water. So that investing in the infrastructure is only partial investment for long-term equitable usage of those dollars. We need to encourage the, 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 the governor, the future governor, and the lawmakers down to the local level to include the in, uh, investment in the people as well. Yes. 
I think that goes yeah. back to the delegate's points about uh, convening, because we have to remember this work is not equal, it is equitable, because what is needed in one place is not needed in another. But if we come together and convene, then we would know what each other needs, I think, to both of your points, and create something more robust, not just in our little spaces, but <laughs> convening um, as a state, knowing what other areas do and how do we do that together, but how do we learn from one each other um, and knowing uh, and seeing those different um, challenges and issues across the state. Okay, and those 100 year storms that keep happening every year, every two years, I'm like, it's not 100 years, but yeah. So uh, one last question, what about new, new clean nuclear energy technologies, especially with regards to education and jobs for communities of color? I know it's a lot. It's a little loaded too. It is very yeah, loaded. Yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll just be frank. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan or a proponent of nuclear energy expansion in any way. That's just the Stephanie Smith platform. Um, but I, I definitely believe that it's been incredibly, um, as an industry, it's had to be subsidized to such an extreme degree. I just don't see it as the most viable path forward for renewable when there's other things that are clean, that are less um, intensive, and do not need to be subsidized to such a degree to find themselves to be value to be um, profitable. So I'm, I'm much more interested in using my limited capacity to really focus on renewable energies related to wind technology and other hydropower technologies, and not as much. Um, I don't feel like I have the bandwidth to pursue making nuclear energy more tenable for myself and and I'll just add um, not necessarily to the question of nuclear energy but green jobs for communities of color yeah. I mean if you want folks to get involved and stay involved you need to make opportunities to have a life to, to provide for family provide for self um, and that's a big missing component I, I see many people out there in the green space in these green organizations. They got jobs. They're talking to people. They're on the street. They're making money. We need to see black and brown folks doing the same thing, providing those opportunities, green jobs, get people involved, provide a, a way to, to make a living. But can I add something just really quick, to Abel? We don't want dead-end green jobs. Exactly. Because yes. oftentimes yes. we're offering Thank black yes. and brown people entry-level forever jobs, mm -hmm. and there needs to be a continuum where they can continue to have a ladder. Yes. Uh, and I just want to say, I'm with yeah. you, but we exactly. need a ladder. Yes. Within exactly. Those. exactly. So <laughs> that that's been in dead-end jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's also what comes with like these new infrastructures. Like, um, going like from this burning and burning system to this reuse system can create up to 1,500 jobs new jobs in this and that and that's not you know like people say like when we was, when we say shut down the incinerator that that's a war on their jobs that work at the incinerator it's not a war on jobs it's a, it shouldn't be a decision on working there and sacrificing communities when there is a way to actually have a job and actually benefits the community we can make local jobs for residents by changing the systems we have and it creates more jobs and those should be for residents you know they should have access for residents of color um, also in those communities. So I think it's actually, again, making that change and investing in those infrastructures that can create jobs for residents. Um, that's not burning and burying. That's not the way. All right. Again, thank you panelists uh, for joining us this evening uh, in this really great conversation. We'll have to talk about this again sometime. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to um, Madam Chair, or Chairperson of the Maryland Democratic Party, Yvette Lewis. Delegate Smith, Delegate Boyce, Shoshanda, Abel, and Keisha. Thank you so very much for tonight. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for sharing your passion with all of us. This was truly an inspiring and informative evening, and I certainly hope everyone watching has enjoyed this very important discussion. The future of equality depends on our ability to fight this crisis with environmental justice squarely at the forefront of all of our minds. So thank you, I am so very grateful. I'd also like to give a special thank you to Delegate Heather Bagnell, who has joined us this evening um, to be a part of this very important discussion. We're not only grateful for having her here, but we're grateful for her leadership for all of us. And of course, thank you to Ed Hatcher and Angie Cannon for your partnership and also thank you to Arnold Richmond as well. I hope everyone watching will join us next month for our fourth climate change series event, 
when we will be joined by several of our county executives. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a good evening.